Hey everyone, welcome back to Functional Programming 101. In the last video, I gave a brief explanation of what FP is and what this series is gonna be about, and then ultimately how every video is gonna be structured from here on out. In this video and the next, we're gonna be covering two fundamental concepts of functional programming, and that is algebraic data types and type classes. The sooner you take the time to understand these two things, the better, because I think it's going to help you categorize new concepts as you begin to learn more in functional programming. This video is actually going to be the first official video of the series, and we're going to be covering, like I said, algebraic data types, and they're more commonly referred to as ADTs for short. So between this video and the next, I'm going to help explain the differences by showing you examples of common types for ADTs and type classes. Now here's the high level value add. Algebraic data types offer us composable data structures which in some cases offer us better branching logic as well. By using these data structures, it forces you as the developer to explicitly handle all possible states that that data can be in. And this gives us better pattern matching capabilities, which makes our code more reliable. All right, so let me walk you through some code to help explain what I'm talking about here. Now, before we start to jump into this code, let me just point out the fact that this repository, FP101 series, is going to be publicly available on GitHub for you to pull down as well so that you can play with it. I'm going to leave a link in the video description so that you can easily find that. All right, so I'm going to start by bumping up the font size here. Here so you can read this a little bit better and we'll start by unpacking this top comment which states that the two most common ADT types are product and sum. Whether or not the data type is a product or a sum can be derived by counting the inhibitance or the values of a given type. So for instance if we're looking at this option we can say that it's a sum type because it can either be a none or a sum. The two most common product types that you're going to see with ADTs are records and tuples. Records you can think of as basic objects while now, tuples can hold an in amount of elements where each element can be its own data type. And here we have a contrived example of what a product type might look like. So this clock is composed of an hour and a period. And the hour can be 1 through 12, while the period can be AM or PM. There's this basic arithmetic associated with the process of counting all possible inhibitants or values. And as you might have guessed, with some, you're just adding those up. So an option can be this or that, and it can go on. It doesn't just have to be only only two. And then for product, we have this, um, the clock type has a possibility of 24 inhibitants due to the nature of this times that. So another really common sum type is going to be the either. Now an either can hold either a left or a right. And convention dictates that the left is going to hold an error while the right holds the expected value. This can be really helpful for form validation or when used in conjunction with another ADT like task where something might fail in the future, like a promise that's waiting to resolve. Okay, and before moving on, we have to give credit where it's due. So this example with the clock is pulled from this amazing series written by Giulio Conte. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, but this guy is amazing. And he put together this library that we're gonna be using throughout the series known as FPTS. And I'm gonna link it in the notes so that you can dig through this stuff yourself. Now let's go ahead and spin this app up real quick before we hop into the business logic and I show you some examples. Here is app TSX. All right, I'm gonna slam this terminal down so it gives us more space. And as mentioned, FPTS is what we're pulling from. So we're not gonna use the option that was created here. We're actually gonna pull the one from FPTS. Now we're gonna make our way down. So the initial state that we care to capture in this component is an avatar string. And then we have the request status. So we're going to be making this API fetch and we're going to make sure that we model the status of that request as it's pending and if it gets resolved or not. You're not always going to slam everything into an option, but generally in a lot of cases, I find it to be very useful, especially for initializing state where we have this none. And then whenever something resolves, we'll slap it into a sum and then we know that we can pull that value you out. So we have the project running over here in the browser and we can see that the initial value for this is a none and then the request status is idle. And if we hop back over to the code, you can see what that markup looks like. Okay, now we're going to leverage these types to do something very common that you're always going to do, which is fetch data. So we won't touch upon what safe request is. We'll save that for another video, but essentially it's just making the fetch lazy and it's making it pure in the way that we can compose it with other things in our application. So we're gonna expand this use effect and we're gonna comment back in this code 
right? And I'm gonna talk you through it. So the first thing we do is set the request status to loading. And then we go ahead and fetch that user. And you can see this is a task either. Again, we won't dive into what this is just yet, but certainly will in coming videos. And you can see that what it's wrapping is a promise that holds an either with an error or a response. And here's where we get into the fun part of pattern matching. So the either has this method attached to it called fold, which says, hey, I know how to branch the logic within here. If you've given me a left, then this is what's going to happen. And if you've given me a right, then this is what's going to happen. And the beauty about this is that we've accounted for each possible state and we're still type safe. So if I hover over data, you can see what that looks like. Now the API that I'm working with gives us back a response dot data dot data. So I'm destructuring it right here and renaming it response so that this looks a little bit more clean. I want to highlight over response again and show you something that's important. So you see we have avatar here that could be a string or a null. Now this is very typical whenever you're fetching data over the wire from a backend API, you may not get all the data that you're anticipating. And whenever that happens, typically you have to do defensive programming where you say, hey, if this thing isn't there, then let's fail safely and show something else. Okay, so given that we know avatar can be null, what we're gonna do is wrap it back up into an option. We take that raw value of this avatar, which is string or null, and we wrap that back up into an option type. Now, this pipe right here, all this is is doing left to right composition. So the result of this line is gonna be fed into this function where we do the fold. And if it's a none, then we're in our on left or on error case. And if it's a sum, then we're in the success case. And again, it's type safe all the way down. And we know at this time, for sure, we have an avatar that we can go ahead and set. Now, just to make sure that I hammer on the points of these ADTs, option, and either, I wanna go ahead and look at the code again and show you what's going on, just a brief recap. So we've said, hey, whenever this component mounts, we wanna go ahead and fetch this user's information. And whenever that resolves, we're either going to have an error or we're gonna have the response that we expect. So here we do our branching logic. And on the success case, we pull out that response and we know that given the API contract avatar may or may not be there so in order to safely set it in our component we do this other pipe right here where we handle that branch and logic that dictates whether or not the thing we expect is there so let's just real quick prove that this is working how we expect so if I go over here and I bust open the console log you should be able to see we have an e dot right or either right and in there contains our information that we expect. However, if I come over here and let's say that we fat fingered the URL and we save that, whenever we come over here and refresh, you could see that the request status is an error and we still have the avatar option set to none. And then inside, if we expand this, we can see that we have a request error. Inside it says what the message is, fail to fetch. Okay, so let's go ahead and fix this again. Cancel that out, come back over here, undo what we did, save it. And as you can see, we're back in our success. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Um, instead of doing all this pipe stuff, you know, we could just check at this line if it has the avatar, then let's go ahead and do what we want to do otherwise not and you know we could wrap it in an if block and say hey if the response has what we need then let's go ahead and safely set it here but the thing that i want to point out here is that this gets us back to the imperative land where things are less composable and because of the imperative nature whenever your code starts to get riddled with a bunch of if blocks and else if and what have you there becomes a lot of overhead cognition for other developers on your team to come in and understand the intent the control flow and what the business logic is supposed to be doing and not just other developers this can also be burdensome for your future yourself whenever you come back after a couple months or a couple weeks and you look at some old code that you authored and you think to yourself my god what is really going on here so whenever we lift values up into these ADTs and we use these common patterns like pipe and folding on these different wrappers we get this very consistent pattern and it makes it a lot less troublesome whenever you need to revisit old code or you need to refactor some things okay now before we wrap up this video let me go ahead and get rid of this 
this block, we don't need that. I did want to touch briefly on this other ADT known as remote data. And it too is a sun type where it has these tagged unions. This right here, this fetch that we're doing is modeling the process of actually making a network request and what the status of that request is. Now, if we use something like remote data, over here, you can see we have an article on it and I'll link this in the video's description. This article is written as well by Jacanti, same guy who wrote this article on the algebraic data types. And he's also the author of the FPTS library that we'll be using a lot in this series. In this article, he introduces us to the concept of remote data. And I'm just gonna break it down for you real fast and say that there are a possibility of four states whenever we're fetching some, right? So it's either that we haven't asked, which is the initial state, or we've asked and we haven't gotten a response yet, which is the pending or loading state. And then the last two states are, we've gotten a response, but maybe there was an error or we've gotten the data that we want. And what's helpful about using this remote data ADT is that it's more feature rich in that it implements a few different type classes that's gonna give us inherited functionality. And one of those is going to be the ability to fold. So if I jump over to the repository, for this ADT. You can see right here what it does in the end is if entities is a remote data that's possibly holding customers, we can fold off of that in the return value. So for our JSX, and whenever we do that, it forces us to handle the initial state, the pending state, the failure state, and then if anything came through, then we have a successful case where we can safely map through that response. And this is, as you guess, going to type check all the way through. Every time you see fold, you can essentially think about pattern matching on these tagged units. So I'm gonna jump back real quick into the article. There's a nice quote here that says, the nice thing about this data model is the type checker will now force you to write the correct UI code. It will keep track of the possibility of things not loaded and errors and force you to handle them all in the UI. This is a very powerful abstraction, my friend. It's gonna make your code more resilient for sure. We're gonna pause before diving any deeper there. I promise that we'll come back and explore this further because there's definitely more to it than just the ability to fold. There's more features that we can tap into as well that's gonna buy us a lot. Now, when it comes to getting the job done as a software engineer, the goal is to ship software in a timely manner and hopefully without accruing a lot of tech debt along the way. And naturally so, whenever you do this for a living, you begin to get hit with these deadlines and time crunches. And realistically, that's the nature of a lot of projects. But I think that as engineers, a lot of times, without even knowing it, we find ourselves reinventing the wheel whenever we're trying to problem solve in our applications. As we encounter new requirements, build new features, address new bugs, etc. I think that we begin to think that our app's complexity is very unique in its own right. And therefore, a lot of times we might start trying to reinvent the wheel and how we solution for these problems. But by leveraging these concepts within FP, we can start to generalize these problems and we can begin to find more robust solutions for them. The big takeaway from today's video is that ADTs give us a more predictable way of repackaging data or values flowing through our application into these composable data structures. And like we touched on with branching logic, it enforces us to account for all possible states at the time of integration. And when you're working in a strictly typed language like TypeScript, lifting these raw values from our applications into these data types only further strengthens the enforcements like handling all known states, all of which can be caught right within your code editor. And this saves you a ton of time from discovering bugs in the browser while developing, or even worse, in production. That's gonna be it for this video. In the next one, we're gonna discuss what type classes are and we'll explore a few common examples as well. All right, see you guys then.